We're happy for the presence of everyone this evening. I invite you to be back with us at every opportunity. We have a couple of announcements before we begin our worship. We're thankful to see some folks here that we hadn't seen in a while. Uh, happy to see folks that have not been able to be with us and also folks that have traveled a long way to be with us. It's good to see you. Let's begin our worship tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your blessings. Father, help us to be mindful of how truly blessed that we are and to never take you for granted. Father, we're so thankful for the love that abides here. We're thankful for each other. We're thankful for those that are visiting with us tonight, the opportunities that you give us to worship with one another and to love one another. Father, help us to love more every day because we know that you are love. And help us as we worship tonight to do it in spirit and in truth. Father, bless our hearts. Help us to grow in spirit and in number in this congregation as well as in zeal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first song this evening will be number 200, 200, zero, zero, and after this song we'll have our first prayer. Praise his name, young man. 
Would please bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day that you blessed us with. And as we come to the close of this day, we are thankful that we have another opportunity to gather together and worship you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the many ways in which you have blessed us. We are so thankful for this time of year when we take a pause and we get to spend time with our families. We are so thankful. Um, for those that we still have to gather with. And dear Heavenly Father, as we come together at this time of year, we often think of our loved ones who have gone on before us, and this can be a sad, sad time for some families. And we pray that we all just keep in, in perspective that we are here for a short time and that we enjoy the times that we have together and live the lives that we should so that someday we can all be together for eternity. And dear Heavenly Father, we are so mindful of those who are experiencing health problems and difficulties at this time. We pray that you please be with them and be with the doctors that care for them and that they may be returned to their health that they so desire. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are in so much need in this world. We pray that we see those individuals who are among us. We see those as opportunities when they present themselves to us and we help those that we come in contact with that need assistance. And dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this congregation who meets here. We pray for the continued efforts of this congregation and for the leadership as it continues to steer this congregation and that it will remain a light in this community and abroad. And dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your son Jesus who came and lived here on this earth and provided the example that we all strive to follow. We are so thankful for his birth and for his life and for his death and for his burial and resurrection. And it's through that that we have the hope of eternity with you and that we can be forgiven of our sins. And dear Heavenly Father, we do pray for forgiveness of our sins and we pray that when we do, that we acknowledge that and we make that right in our lives and those that we do offend so that we can be the example of, the, of a Christian to others and not an example of hypocrisy. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that this worship service is pleasing unto you and that we clear our minds of all of our worldly thoughts and our daily struggles and that we dedicate ourselves to your study of your word and to taking the things that are said and applying them to our lives and that we examine our lives so that we can be um, the people that we should. And it's our prayer that the things that are taught, the songs that are sang, and the words that the, through the prayers that are lifted up to you will be pleasing in your sight. And it's in your son's name that we do pray. Amen. Number 378. 378. Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell. Oh. Uh -huh. 
If you would like to mark our invitation song, it will be number 653, number 653. And the song that we'll sing before Brother Mitchell comes and preaches to us from God's Word will be number 333. 333. Welcome back this Sunday evening or afternoon. I never can get used to it getting dark so early and so quick. You've heard me cite the 
example, the old Indian chief, American Indian, said one time nobody but the white man would try to take an hour off one end of the day and put it on the other end and make it longer. And uh, I think about that a lot. It kind of makes sense. In Mark chapter 15, verses 15 through 24, this morning we talked about when Jesus came. And I want us to think together tonight about when he left and how he left. And so in Mark 15, beginning at verse 15, it says, wishing to satisfy the crowd. This is Jesus with Pilate. Pilate released Barabbas. Barabbas was a thug and an outlaw for, uh, for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers took him away into the place, that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. They dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put that on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they kept beating him, beating his head with a reed or a stick, and spitting on him, and kneeling uh, and bowing before him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him and put his own garments on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. And they crucified him. Just imagine that, the son of the very God, uh, the one who was in the beginning with God and was God, uh, the one who was the active agent of all that is, to care enough about us to come here to begin with and to care enough about us to uh, allow those people to put their filthy hands on him. It's an incredible thought. After being born into the world and living a comparatively short life, the Savior died. And more than anyone else, his death was significantly, significantly and historically important. I mean, everybody's life's important. But the life of Christ and the death of Christ uh, reach a level of significance that have not been equal since. The day of the Lord's crucifixion marked the day that he died for our sins. He opened the door to heaven for us, and there was no one else that could do it. And all of this was part of God's plan from the very beginning. We read from Revelation 13 at verse 8 this morning, where John was moved to write, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb and who has been slain. As we come to this and think about when he left and how he left, it's important to get the historical setting. Jesus lived a perfect life before us, before everyone, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, there's no flaw found in him, and he lived that life as a flesh and blood man like you and I. And of course, when you think about that a little bit, it removes every excuse that anybody would have for not being what they ought to be and what he asked us to be. In the previous lesson, the Lord's humanity was stressed in the fact that he came to earth and that he partook or took up flesh and blood and was made like his brethren in all things. In Hebrews chapter 2, that's verses 14 and 17. But there was a profound difference between Jesus' life and the lives of other men. Paul uh, describes the universal sin problem that troubles mankind, that really made it necessary, if man is to be saved, any man, for Jesus to come. And that is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23 unsurmountable. Uh, not in, there's nothing we could say, nothing we could do, nothing that we have that God needs that all belongs to him. And so there we are, lost and undone and without God. So in contrast, Jesus uh, came here and he was separated from sinners, according to Hebrews 7 and 26, because he was perfectly sinless. That's what made him separate. Not that he shunned people. In he gave us an example to follow in that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 21 and 22, he says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, and neither was any guile or deceit found in his mouth. 
Jesus' life is the pattern. There were some fellows a few years ago that liked to call themselves scholars that said uh, there was, wasn't a pattern. And that pattern theology and pattern orthodoxy was out and uh, whatever it is they were selling was in. But right here, an example is a pattern, isn't it? Am I, am I just bereft of understanding the English language? An example is a pattern. And he is that pattern. It, it, it was left for us. And when he came, he was sinless, which meant his crucifixion was undeserved. There was no reason to harm him in any way and certainly no reason to disrespect him and humiliate him. In Isaiah's prophecy, he spoke of a suffering Christ, a suffering Savior. And so that is really not a surprise if you've read the text. And the Jews should have been familiar with that. First, uh, I mean, in Isaiah 53, at verse 9, it says, His grace was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And so he was among the wicked, but he wasn't wicked. And when Pilate examined the Lord, he recognized himself, a pagan, that there is no guilt in him, John 19 and verse 4. But being a pagan and being a politician, he succumbed to the pressure that the Jews uh, placed upon him and allowed an innocent man that he knew was innocent to be executed for no crime of his own. Jesus was rejected by his own people, and that too was a matter of prophecy, centuries, seven centuries at least, before his arrival. In Isaiah 53 at verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. That's a direct prophecy of the coming Savior. When Pilate presents Jesus before the Jewish crowd, as their king, the people demanded his crucifixion, and they even said that they had no king but Caesar. They despised Caesar. On any other day, they loathed Caesar, but they were not going to accept Christ. And you look in John 19, verses 4 and 5, it says, Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And Jesus then came out wearing the thorn of, uh, crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, behold the man. And he goes on and presents him to them uh, as their king, and they deny him. Jesus, uh, the, the Jews, uh, I should say the Jews uh, reject him despite what the scriptures say about him. Now, there are people that have been entrusted with the mind of God revealed in scripture. Nobody else had the privilege that they had. And yet they're going to reject him in spite of what the scripture said in Galatians 3 and 24 says, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. So who should have accepted the Christ? Who, have, who of all people should have had celebrations about his arrival and bid everybody to come to him on his terms? But they didn't do that. Uh, they did not justify themselves or allow themselves to be justified by faith. They rejected him. And Jesus said that the, the scriptures testified about him. And he explained later in Luke 24 and verse 44, all things which were written about him in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And so despite the scriptural evidence Scriptures which they were entrusted with, scripture, scriptures that they read aloud in the synagogue on every Sabbath day, they rejected him. Acts 15, 21 says they read in the synagogue every Sabbath. The Jews rejected those scriptures. And they also rejected him in spite of what they'd seen him do and what they'd heard him say. One of their own said, never a man ever spake like this man. That was true. And there was nobody that did the, the mighty deeds that he did in the number and in the consistency with which he did them. John said at the end of his gospel that we're written a few of these representative acts of miraculous power. But if, if we should try to write all of that, the world wouldn't contain the books. And so it was done in a number of times. And they still rejected him. And in addition to the scriptures, Jesus said his works testified of him. 
If you won't accept the scripture, at least accept what you see happening before your eyes. John 5 and verse 36 says, But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. You got a man that is healing the sick, raising the dead, uh, walking on water, defying the demonic powers, ordering them around like, like what they are, and they have to obey his word, and all of that is happening right in front of them. He said, accept the works if you don't accept anything else. But when people get the bit in their mouth, like an old tough mouth horse, uh, then they're not going to listen. And that's where they were. And when the Jews demanded that Jesus tell them plainly if he was the Christ, in John 10, 24 and 25, he replies to that, I told you, and yet you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These testify of me, again, citing what he'd done in their presence. We don't accept him. Ample evidence shows that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the very God, yet the people ignored the evidence and they rejected him. And you know what a lot of the intelligentsia is doing today in our own homeland? They're brazenly rejecting all of that evidentiary material. They turn their nose up at it and they... Uh, make fun of it, and present themselves as if they are somewhat. And yet there it is, still staring right back at them. The Lord knew when he was here what was going to happen to him. There were no mysteries for him. And when he was led away to be crucified, it didn't come as a surprise. Earlier that same evening, just prior to his arrest, he knew, John 13 verse 1 says uh, that his hour had come and that he would depart out of this world to the Father. When Judas came with the mob in the garden, Jesus knew already, John 18 and verse 4, all the things that were coming upon him, he knew. And with all of the prophecies pointing to his death on the cross, it should not have been surprising that Jesus is going to be fully aware of what's about to happen. Uh, after all, he was the Word, he is the Word. He not was anything, he is the Word made flesh. And John 1, verse 1, and then I'll grab verse 14, but verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You drop down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Even while He was on earth, Jesus revealed His knowledge of what was to happen, providing clues to others about his destiny. For example, he told Nicodemus, came to him inquiring about him. And he tells Nicodemus in John 3 and verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man, referring to himself, must be lifted up. Referring to the cross there. And then later he tells the disciples in John 12 at verse 32, and I, if I am lifted up to the earth, will draw all men to myself. Again, that reference, uh, an oblique reference, but a reference to the cross. John adds this statement made in John 12, 33, to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. That's why he was speaking as he did. Matthew recorded in Matthew 16 and 21, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. You know, I never, ever can quite grasp that it was the priest and the religious leadership of his country, the people that had, again, the greatest opportunity to know, the greatest access to the words of God, and they're the ones that lead the charge in rejecting their own Savior. Isn't that the way man has been so often, too often? And aren't you glad that somebody cared enough about you, whether you were a little child and brought to Bible class from the time you are a toddler up or somebody intervened because they cared at some point along the way in your life and led you to a knowledge of the truth and helped you come to the conclusion to obey the gospel of Jesus? Aren't you glad that you're not where so many befuddled people are that see themselves as somewhat when they're 
they're drowning in ignorance. None of these things that took place surprised Jesus. He knew what was going to take place and that he knew above all things he came to do the Father's will. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 5, the Hebrews writer pens these words, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, have I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. You know in the Mosaic economy that those sacrifices were made day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year. And he's, he's saying explicitly, God didn't take pleasure in that because we're going to see of the inadequacy of those sacrifices. And he dealt with it. He dealt with it once and for all. Well, we've got the historical background. Then you come to the day's events when he left us, at least for a time, for three days. Jesus' prayer in the garden is the first thing we want to notice. In his prayer, the Lord demonstrates a willingness to suffer, a willingness to submit to the Father, whatever the outcome, whatever the requirement. Nothing is too strenuous. Nothing is too difficult. He'll do what God says do. In Mark 14, in verse 36, the text says, and he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Paul cites this example to stress our need for a, a willingness to humble ourselves as Jesus did. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, he wrote, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's important to understand that Jesus did not grudgingly go along with the Father's will. It was not uh, something that he just had to grit his teeth because he didn't really want to do it, but he did it anyway. I don't think that's an accurate portrayal. When he prayed for the cup to be removed, if possible, he's struggling, struggling with humanity, but he's not seeking ultimately to avoid that cross because he knew what was to take place before he ever got to Jerusalem. He knew that six months before he got to Jerusalem. We've been studying the Gospel of Luke where he cites that, that he's going there to meet his fate. Yet he clearly indicates in these prayers and encounters in this prayer in the garden that he is willing to suffer the anguish that's coming. In John 10, verses 17 and 18, it says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again, this commandment I received from my Father. Just think. Nobody took it from him. Nobody could take it from him. All he had to do with that Roman cohort that was mistreating him and ultimately crucified him is tell him to die. But he wasn't here with that kind of thing in his heart. He was trying to save those people. He's trying to save those men. Just like he's trying to save all of us. Jesus prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass. Mark chapter 14 and 35. But not so much praying not to endure the crucifixion, but he's praying that the hour you know, pass and be accomplished. Save me through that cross. Bring me home. Let me be free of this. I'll carry it out. The mockery of a trial and the unjust condemnation is the next major event that takes place subsequent to his prayer. And the trial of Jesus progressed in several stages. If you, you know, it's not like a trial that's a just trial. 
Uh, there are so many infractions in that that uh, it took a legal scholar to untangle all of that. But he was tried first by the priest. And there he faced false accusations and he faced uh, insults and he faced physical abuse. You can read that in Mark 14, uh, about 53 through 65. That was the first encounter. Then he stood before Pilate where he was questioned, found innocent, but condemned to death anyway. That sounds like some places I've been down south. And it's a, it's a terrible thing to think about, but it happens. Still happens in the world. But to happen to the Son of God? And following that, Pilate sends him over to Herod. And Herod treats him with contempt and mocks him before he sends him back to Pilate. That's Luke 23, 11. And so the Lord endured all of these things leading up to his crucifixion. Without complaint and without unleashing what he was able to unleash. He wasn't here to do that. I'll say again. Jesus' suffering and ultimate death then occurs on the cross. Before the cross, Jesus was scourged when Pilate yielded to the Jews' demands to have the Lord crucified. That's Mark 15 and 15. Some of us went together when the movie came out that Mel Gibson did, The Crucifixion. And I'll say this about it. It shows what a crucifixion is. I saw it once. I don't want to see it anymore. But it does show you what a crucifixion is like. It, was, it is so bad that a lot of the artists from the Middle Ages just would not depict that. Uh, it, it, it was too disconcerting. Uh, Gibson did. They showed it in all of its gory detail. And many men died under that scourging. They didn't survive it. But Jesus was a strong man, a young man, and he had that uh, to contend with. And then, you know, carry his cross and all of those things. Mark 15, 15 says, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now, following this is when the soldiers mocked him and abused him before they took him to the place of crucifixion. And when Jesus was crucified, his hands and his feet were nailed to the cross. Psalm 22 had uh, projected that. Psalm 22 and verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me. That's a pretty good description of, of who was mistreating Jesus. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has compassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. John 20 and 25 says, so other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That was Thomas. And so what had been prophesied in Psalm 22, of course, came to fruition. They knew how he died, and he wanted proof, and he got it. And when he got the proof, you will remember the reaction that Thomas had. He fell before him and said, my Lord and my God. Well, he's mine too and no doubt yours as well. Once he hung in the air, the mocking continued. You, know, you can read all of that in, in Mark 15. But they, you know, if, if you're all this great thing, heal yourself, come down from there, and all of that. And that was, no doubt, they just yucked it up. They thought that was something that they ought to make fun of and make light of. You know, it is a terrible, terrible thing uh, whenever the, the state has to inflict the ultimate punishment on a human being. It's a terrible thing when a human being so misbehaves that they put themselves in the penitentiary. That's a terrible thing. There's nothing funny about it. And yet here these people are reacting that way. The physical abuse and torture his body endured throughout that ordeal was extreme. It took a strong man to last as long as he did. There was one writer in the International Standard a Bible encyclopedia that said the victim of crucifixion died a thousand deaths. And people that are knowledgeable of such matters uh, would corroborate that. Jesus knew, brethren, he knew all of this. He knew what was coming. He understood what was facing him, and he went anyway. Do you know anybody else that would do that? I, I just, you know, that would, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Jesus knew, John 18, verse 4 says, So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to that mob, when they go, Who do you seek? Who are you here for? Signs were seen in his death. There are several signs accompanying the, G, the death of Jesus that are miraculous in their nature. There was darkness that fell all across the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour when it's not dark. Mark chapter 15, verse 33. Fell over the whole land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Can't deny that. Can't undermine that. There were, the whole country experienced it and no telling how far else. The veil of the temple was torn. Matthew chapter 15, or Mark rather, chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. And Jesus uttered with a loud voice or loud cry and breathed his last and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It wasn't a man that did that because there was nobody up there on the top of that. And it tore from top to bottom. Opened the way to everybody. Not just Jews and, uh, and, and them once a year in the Holy of Holies. Everybody can approach the Lord now. The earth shook, tombs were opened, and the dead were raised. Matthew chapter 27, uh, 27, yes, verse 52 and 3, the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after this, his resurrection, they entered into the holy city and appeared to many. These signs, these incontrovertible signs, even in the uh, done or especially done in the face of his adversaries and people that had every reason to mock and deny a Roman centurion said in Mark 15 and verse 39, truly this man was the son of God. He got it and he understood. Essential lessons come from this day. One is that there must be a suitable sacrifice to pay for the sin problem. It, 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 there is no one that could do what he did but him. He's the sole person. And while, while discussing the comparison between the sacrifices offered under the laws, a law of Moses and the sacrifice of Christ, a Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Keep that in mind. Ad animal sacrifices had been offered continually, as I noted earlier, year after year after year. In fact, daily. But the system under the old law contained Hebrews 10 verse 1, only a shadow of the good things to come, not the very form of those things. The old system given by God, but it's only a shadow. It's taken us somewhere, but this is not all of it. Because of this, the Hebrews writer declares in Hebrews 10 verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So they've shed rivers of blood and through the centuries, they've demonstrated to themselves that that can't deal with the sin problem. And my blood or your blood won't deal with it for that matter. Or the blood of tens of thousands because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And since animal sacrifices offered under the law of Moses could not take away sins, according to Hebrews 10 and 4, and there could be no forgiveness without blood being shed, Hebrews 9, 22, that meant another sacrifice, an adequate sacrifice, a suitable sacrifice is absolutely necessary for forgiveness to be possible for mankind to inherit heaven, Jesus would have to shed his blood on the cross because only the incarnate Christ was a sufficient sacrifice to pay the enormity of the debt and satisfy the justice of the Father. There was no other. And when God searched out through his treasure stores in heaven itself, there was only one jewel, only one, and that is Jesus to give himself. The Hebrews writer explained in Hebrews 10, verses 5 and 10, respectively, 
Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's a reason that I'm not in Jerusalem offering up burnt offerings because Jesus did that one time and that's all it took. We remember this sacrifice when we observe the Lord's Supper. That's what that's about, to remember the blood that we shed. We would not be concerned in celebrating his birth if, if, if it had not been that he shed his blood. And not only that, that he arose from the dead on the third day like he said he would. Before his death, Jesus himself instituted the Lord's Supper and he gave the cup as a symbol of his blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, he said, Matthew 26, 28. And this memorial is to be observed every first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 sets that precedent among our brethren because of how essential it is for us to remember and not to forget and not to get so consumed in other things that we don't continually keep before us that God paid the price so that we wouldn't have to. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come and he's coming. And we must remember and we must continue to proclaim the Lord's death even today. Jesus is supremely qualified to be that sacrifice. He stands alone in that. There's no other like him. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was qualified to serve as a mediator because he shared both divine and human nature in one person. You say, well, how could that be? I'm sure I don't know. I don't know the modus operandi of, of God, how he accomplishes that, but he did. That's what he said. In John 1, verse 14, it says, The fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form in him. And Colossians 2 and verse 9 also deals with that. He also became flesh and dwelt among us, it says in John 1, 14. Therefore, he was an able mediator. He was qualified to be a go-between between God and man. He alone was able to bring about reconciliation between the two parties. You know, today they'll, they'll try to involve people in, or to persuade people involved in a legal dispute to see if they can't work it out before they get into the court system. And they hire somebody to help them do that. Well, Jesus could do that and did do that and does do that for us. Jesus is unique, different from every high priest in that he is absolutely perfectly qualified for his position. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 beginning says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priest to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever no one else could ever have been qualified to fill that role he stands alone and further only Jesus is qualified to offer and to be the sacrifice for our sins. Nobody else. In the passages just cited, we saw that the priest under the law of Moses offered up sacrifices all the time of bulls and goats and what have you. While Jesus made the perfect sacrifice once for all in offering himself in Hebrews 7 and 27. We are blessed indeed. Blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond comprehension. Jesus' sacrifice is completely effective. And that's a lesson we want to take any time that we consider the day that he left us. Unlike the sacrifices offered under Moses' law, Jesus' sacrifice was able to remove sin, take it away. Again, the sacrifices under the old law offered continually never could take away sin, never did take away sin. They just brought us to the time and the place where Jesus dealt with the problem. 
Jesus' sacrifice was the one offering that perfected for all time those who were sanctified. John said in 1 John 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. The effectiveness of the Lord's sacrifice on the cross was and is for everyone. The Jews liked, to, liked at that time to think they were better than everybody else. They weren't. And nor any of the rest of us. But thank God, it's for everybody. Rich people, poor people, all the people. There are no distinctions in that. God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is different from what's taught in John Calvin's doctrine where they talk about a limited atonement and then the Lord atones only for the elect. That's not what it says here. Paul wrote in Titus 2 and verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Everybody is subject to the gospel call. The salvation made possible by Jesus' sacrifice is open to everybody. Nevertheless, this salvation is conditional. Though God's grace has appeared to all men, we know that not all men will be saved. Jesus taught that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, when he talked about the straight and narrow way that leads to life and few there be who go in by it. So not everybody is going to going to decide to walk with God and be saved. How can that be? Well, the only way to harmonize these passages is to conclude that he offers salvation to everyone, but not everybody will meet the conditions that he lays down. In Mark 16 and 16, he says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And so not everybody's going to accept his invitation, and not all are going to answer the call. He is, Hebrews 5 and verse 9 tells us, to all those who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. And so that's a, that's, there's a condition placed upon it. Only Jesus' crucifixion made salvation available. But we have to accept his offer by complying with the terms that he lays down. Previously, this morning, attention was laid on the fact that God's love was one of the key lessons that we take from his birth, that he would come here in this low land of sin. Don't you know that the way humanity conducts itself is offensive to one that's pristine and perfect and pure in every way? But he came. The death of Christ is necessarily connected with that. Because God loved the world, he sent Jesus to die on the cross, and that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, Romans 5 and verse 8 says, Christ died for us. Salvation is open to all, but one must take advantage of his gracious offer. Since he gave his life for us, we must be willing to give our life to him and to make of our lives a holy, living sacrifice acceptable to God. Romans 12 and verse 1. And so the question I leave with you is, will you accept his invitation? Will you accept his offer? I'm not going to try to coerce you. I don't have authority to coerce you. And, and so I'm not, I'm not about that, and nor is anybody in this house. You have to make a decision. But if you walk the streets of gold, if you go through the gates of heaven, it'll be the same for you as it was for everybody else that you say yes to the Lord's invitation. If you believe Jesus of Nazareth is God's son, then repent and turn away from sin and confess his name. Confess your faith in him and consent to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins. Rise to walk in a new life and walk right on into heaven when you leave this world. If we can help you, we want to do that as together we stand and sing.
Be seated, please. To help to prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 359, number 359. Jesus, keep me. Does anyone that will be partaking of the Lord's Supper need uh, the communion supplies? This time, let us focus our minds on the love, the, the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we are about to have some partake of the 
bread that represents Jesus' body that hung on the cross for our sins. Help each one of us, Father, to go back to that scene on the cross to remember that wonderful love. Help us, Father, to partake in a way well-pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's sinless blood that he shed on the cross for our sins, Father, help us to do this in a way well-pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As this is a convenient time, we will also have a prayer for the offering. As most of you know, there's a box in the foyer where you can place your contribution. Would you pray with me, please? Our God and our Father, the giver of all good things, Father, we know that everything that we have comes from you. Father, we pray that you will help us as we purpose in our heart what to give back to you and that we give cheerfully, Father. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to again thank all of you that have been here today and and urge you to come back Wednesday night if you're in the community. And you know what? If you speak of the Lord's church out here in this community, speak well. I don't know about you, but my mom always said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. Now, no reports have come back to me about anybody being naughty, but I just thought it was an opportune time to say what I just said. So if we talk about the church, speak well of it and invite other people to come and to to learn what you've learned and to benefit from the things that you benefit from in in a spiritual way and uh, pray for opportunities to reach out to outsiders and opportunities to reach out to those who have gone back out into the far country like the prodigal did. And let's pray that not only we'll have opportunities, but we'll be able to gain them back. Uh, As we depart this place, let's stand as we're being dismissed in our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're ever so grateful to have had this opportunity to come together this morning and this evening. We're thankful for today's lessons and uh, the message that was brought to us that we can take and apply to our lives and go out into a troubled world and help bring others closer to you. We just ask that you... Continue to help bless us and encourage us to continue fighting the good fight, see through all the chaos and the turmoil, and help bring others closer to you. Just uh, continue to light our path and guide us, protect us, and keep us safe. And be with those that are traveling during the holiday season. Just keep them safe to and from their destinations. And just ask that you continue to watch over everyone, and particularly those that are struggling with various illnesses or maybe facing upcoming medical procedures and such. Just be with them and give them strength and help them to recover if it be your will. All these things we ask in your son's name, we pray. Amen.